Hi, Emma, and welcome to the show. And thank you so much for being on the show today. I'm really looking forward to speaking with you. And you're in New Zealand. So how life, how is life there for you? Well, New Zealand at the moment, it's cold, but it's an amazing place to be. We're very lucky to be moving around and enjoying uh, culture and country as um, many parts of the world aren't able to right now. So New Zealand is just fabulous. Yes, it is. And and luckily, we can travel to New Zealand and vice versa. We're one of the few places that uh, you can go to and we can go to New Zealand as well. So that's awesome. And look, I'm really excited to talk to you today about a number of topics. And we're going to cover off on breathing, on stress, on trauma and learning to thrive. And they're all things that we all need at the moment, especially through COVID-19 and what everyone has been through. And I found you on social media and, and it was your work in breathing that first caught my eye because there's an explosion of focus on breathing at the moment. It's sort of like a new trendy thing that everyone's sort of looking into and yet we've always breathed and yeah uh, yeah. and you are a physiotherapist a breathing coach and a trauma coach and you have then I found that you have a website called the breathing effect which was absolutely fascinating yes the breath effect yeah yep and okay so let's talk about you and your journey first so you are a physiotherapist what motivated you to start specializing in breathing my journey really came actually very early on so i was 13 when i first had my first experience with learning how to change my breathing Mm -hmm. obviously we're all breathing anyway so that's you know that was okay but i was actually struggling then to to speak in public I had a stutter and a speech impediment really uh, it's something that's in my family yeah that's quite a strong uh, connection with my father one of my brothers had it as well and for me it was at such a barrier to being able to step into school into life and into friendships and I felt very yeah, scared in many ways and mm-hmm. that was also part of the barrier so my first experience is when I was 13 and and the first step of learning speech and drama training was to learn to breathe learn to move your voice in the right way and to be able to project. And so that was a really life-changing experience to start that at a young age. And then breathing kept coming up. It kept coming up in my physio career, not necessarily in my undergraduate, but actually more in my postgraduate. And when I did my master's in physiotherapy, I started to look really at the why the why behind the the conditions that we see clinically and the frustration that I had between the link with both the research that was being done in, in both uh, around the world really, but in physiotherapy and the medical professions. And then the things I was seeing clinically, it didn't add up and it was very frustrating. And so for me, I wanted to go, well, why people get to this place in their life anyway, this place of uh, pain and dysfunction and not moving well, feeling stressed and feeling overwhelmed and in my training, those dots were not being joined. That connection between their story, a patient's stories about why they may have ended up being the way, why why the body has been impacted the way it has. And it wasn't probably until I did my acupuncture training as well. I'm I'm very much a geek with all the things that I've learned and started to assimilate the the connection between the nervous system, particularly your autonomic nervous system, which is your hidden ninja system that really is about regulating your blood pressure, your heart rate, your gut, your hormones, all these things that are working behind the scenes. And when I realized how much we are actually hijacking that and we're not listening to our body. So it came up with that and then came up in my own life. Uh, every few years, I had this kind of slap in the face or a bit of a handbrake moment, which reminded me what I was doing with my body and my nervous system wasn't good enough. And it was this reminder to keep coming back to looking at what holistic wellness would actually be. So often I was the ambulance at the bottom of the hill, helping people when they were already in pain or struggling to sleep or feeling really unwell. But I actually was like, there's a better way of doing this. And so when it came down to it and I looked at the bigger picture, it came down to understanding stress. 
the bit yeah. that we're not joining between the the medical profession, uh, the things that we're doing in, in the, the wellness fields, and actually we're not having enough conversations around how stress is impacting our lives. And it flows into so many areas. And this is when I went down this absolute Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole of going, okay, what does this even mean? How does stress impact so many areas of our body? And when it came down to it, breath was one of the key elements that we both don't do very well, but is the main driver for keeping our body stressed or being able to de-stress. And so that was like a, an aha moment. And I realized that this is a tool that people just were unaware of. And it's why I guess, yeah, it's very much on trend, but breathing and breathing education has been around for a long time because it flows over into so many things like asthma into performance with singing and, mm. um, and speech and drama, all these areas that I know you know a lot about as well. So there's, a, there's connections being made, but I just don't think we had this uh, umbrella overview of how it can really work. And when it came down to it, it was understanding our physiological, our physical and our psychological reaction to stress and how that's manipulating our nervous system and body. Yes. So that's it for really, <laughs> in a nutshell, wow. that's wow. how I got here. Yes. And I know that you've had a number of handbrake moments in your life and there was something that you described that happened to you in 2010 and then we moved into the con man story do you want to tell us a yeah. little bit about that and how you felt in those moments of time and how stress was impacting your body and how you managed that in those moments absolutely so if i rewind to where i was in 2010 I had started my own physio practice from a very early age. I think I was 24 when I started it in this beautiful town in New Zealand called Wanaka, mountains and lakes. And it was just glorious. It was a fabulous place to live. And so I started this busy practice that started with me. And then over within one year, I had three physios working and then the Pilates studio came on board when I brought into that. And it was just, everything was on the go. And I was faking it till I made it because I had no business background, but there was a lot of things that were working really well. I'd done my master's in physiotherapy earlier than that. And that <laughs> made a big difference to um, how, I, how I was able to be successful in that area. And so I realized then that when it became 2010, I'd already been in my physio practice for several years and I'd done the white picket fence of being married, the guy that I'd been with since I was 22. And we were moving along in this kind of, you know, let's look at things like children and houses and all this sort of stuff. And for me, that was um, kind of a natural progression with the upbringing that I had. Yes. But it also felt quite full on at that stage. And I'd already been doing so much because I'm very... Well, a type personality, but very driven as well for things that I do. So then when it came down to um, becoming pregnant, which was actually uh, very easy where we thought we were going to have issues with it because of my, my hormone balance. And I got really unwell with my pregnancies, both my pregnancies. My kids are now uh, at this stage, they're 10 and seven. So it's over a decade ago since that happened. Wow. And what I was really sick with a condition called hyperemesis gravidarum or gravidarum, depending on which country you're in. And that condition meant I had extreme morning sickness. So just not just the little, little wee bit of sickness, nausea here and there. I was sick for um, over 20 something weeks each pregnancy, oh, lost a lot of weight and that baby was growing. And what I realized was the baby was taking all the things it needed from me, but I was the one being depleted. So at the end of the pregnancies, I was postnatally depleted, not depressed, but postnatally depleted. But I'd already put myself in that state before the pregnancy because mm -hmm. of being on go mode and stress and loving it. Cause I love being busy. I love achieving and doing things, yes. but actually the, the way that my body had been pushed uh, wasn't ideal. And I ate well, I exercised, but that's not what holistic health is. It isn't um, the big picture. It's actually, we've got to look at the hidden system behind um, that, you know, under the hood of the car in many ways. <laughs> and we don't do that very well in our medical system. So I would go back to the doctor back then. And I think that my Baxter, my boy was about four or five months old. And I was like, I'm like really tired. Like I don't, I just like super tired. And he was like, well, you've got a new baby. That's part of it. See you. And I was like, no, oh. no, 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 no. This is not good enough. Like no. I know my body's not. Yeah. And so I was like, I'm going to search for answers. And again, went down this rabbit hole of going, what does holistic wellness look like? 
And there was so much learning in that from the nutrition, from the, the building blocks in our body and what it's doing and that stress pathway again and the lifestyle choices I was making with, uh, with work and life and overall just even mindset. There were so many elements that were dictating how I was going to come out of that moment. So that was probably my big moment of going, it's not good enough. I need to change the way that I do things. Mm -hmm. And that was powerful. So I did. And uh, from then onwards, I was really again seeing how much the breath and the body. So what I mean by changing things was going, okay, I'm going to work on my nervous system and listening to it. Uh, and it did. And I felt so much better. And then over the years, there were other moments of life change, as we should call it, yes. uh, including divorce, um, which was a really big experience. And even though my my now ex-husband and I are super amicably divorced. We live on the same street. We co-parent beautifully. Oh. That's a huge experience of grief. And we, we did it really well, but there's still this journey. And, you know, it's about two years we often say of people that are going through divorce. And there's so many different types of grief out there. But again, the emotions, the psychology, the, the pain, the heartbreak of just, you know, losing that family unit, mm. all these things that were not part of my experience. And so when it came down to it again, I had to deal with my body being hijacked and that was really powerful to be able to get my breath and my body uh, back into alignment. So every time I could feel it being hijacked and stressed and overwhelmed, I was like, right, I've got to bring it back. I've got to work on me. I've got to do these self-help tools that will make all the difference. And it did. It really did. Yes. So when you say that you worked on breath, what were you doing? Because I mean, what does mm. that mean? <laughs> Such a good point. And I think that's it. There are so many versions out there. There's the Wim Hof, there's the faster breathing, there's Tomo, yes. Holotropic. Like I can throw words at you and they'll be yes. like, I don't even know what yes. this means. Yes. But when it comes down to breathing as a physiotherapist and as a uh, as someone that is a breathing coach, really what it's about is understanding breath pattern. And so when I look at training the nervous system and the breath, it's such about learning to find calm, first of all, before you start to manipulate and, and change that breathing, which is kind of more the other tools like the faster breath and the holotropic. Those are great tools, but you've actually got to know how to get your body into a calm state before you start to overload it. And that's sometimes the misconceptions or the misunderstanding about how breath work can work in the body. Yeah. So as a physio, for me, it's about understanding muscles that you need to strengthen them, which muscles to use to make sure you're breathing 360 degrees down into your belly and into your back, not just into your chest or into your belly only. And so it's understanding the anatomy, the ones that are muscles that are too tight, that restrict it, and things like the way you breathe through the nose versus mouth. And, and these are things that have been really talked about a lot more, which mm -hmm. is super helpful for me. The guys like James Nestor, who's a journalist, who's written a love. book on, um, yeah, yeah, he's great. I and so love from a James journalist, Nestor. yeah. And he's so good at yes. just like highlighting it and going, okay, so here, think about it this way. I'm like, yes, James, you're putting a, like a magnifying glass on breathing. So more people go, mm, not good enough the way that I'm looking after myself. And maybe mouth breathing for the last 50 plus years isn't serving me long term and mm -hmm. I need to change it. So really what I'm looking at as people's habits and how they get driven to change their body's reaction, including the breath, including their mind, including the posture. And then going, right, what tools are you going to put in place? Because really what it's about is behavioral change. And yeah. that isn't just about take five minutes to breathe and slow down. And then for the rest of the day, you're going to be okay. Because that's like putting a Band-Aid on, um, on a volcano. <laughs> you know, you're not really fixing things. Yes. So you, you said way back, because I, I would love to break down the whole breathing process as well. But just a comment that you made was that you need to calm the mind down first before you look at breathing. And we are going to look at that. So what do we do? How do we calm the, the mind down? What tools can we use? Actually, I'm going to slightly correct that one because I, I do, I probably do, I focus more on the body first to then get right. the mind to quiet. Okay, so yes, funny. yes. So the, the mind is what I found for me when I was going through that full on stage of business and everything, that when I did meditation or mindfulness or yoga, hated it, like absolutely yeah. was like, oh my God, this mm -hmm. is so painful. I want to keep moving. And it's because my body and my breathing was staying stuck in this faster breathing pattern as if I was like running and sprinting. So unless my body is calm 
it won't feel safe and then my mind won't go into that safe place. So really the phys physical aspects of our body and that hijacking need to come first before we're going to feel safe both in our posture and even with the way that we think. So for right. me, changing my breathing was what made the mind then be able to quieten and to be able to tune in. And that's because when you slow the breathing down, the body down and, and learn other ways to relax the nervous system, whether it's body scanning, whether it's muscle contract, relax, uh, whatever way you get that body to let go, what that then tells the brain is we can get it out of the survival brain, this primitive brain that likes to take over, depending on what we're seeing as our stressor in our life. And then our thinking brain can come back on and we can start to use uh, different areas of the brain to actually allow us to quieten. And then it makes it easier versus staying stuck in this place of fear and anxiety and overwhelm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's probably why I'm not very successful at meditation. I do meditate every morning, but it takes me a long time to get into that quietening of the mind phase. And sometimes mm. it's not till the last minute only have a minute yeah. left to go oh well that was a good minute <laughs> but actually um, that's success like please take that as success I because do. often we kind of go I should be going right straight away it's like nobody's got that and and it's about just the more that you try that's training that that muscle of the body and the brain to learn to quiet and 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 I can be like that still now my brain can be busy and overloading and I do you know 10 minutes of the breath practice uh, which the mind will then follow. I mean, we have so many labels for meditation and mindfulness. There's so many avenues yes. to get that body to find calm. And yes. I think that's a bit that I'd like to encourage people to do is to explore those because it's not a one size fits all model. Yes. There's many ways that you can try and get that nervous system to, to drop down into calm. And so I'm like, yes, you did success by at least taking time to slow down. And if you work on the breath first and the, and the patterns that can help slow it down, that can then shift the body to being like, ah, that's easier. I can do that. So let's, let's go into some of these discussions that are being had and some of the questions that are being raised about breathing at the moment. And mm -hmm. some, I mean, for some people, they may think these are no brainer questions, but there are a lot of people that don't understand the breathing process. So how does the breathing process affect heart rate? Because I always thought that you um, slow the breathing down by taking mm -hmm. a slow inhale. And it's the other way around. I was shocked to find that out, that it's the exhalation that slows the breathing down. So do you want to talk about the that process? Absolutely. So this is all connected with this autonomic nervous system. And the, the autonomic nervous system is part of that body's way of surviving. And so it's mm -hmm. working behind the scenes to find homeostasis or body balance and all these aspects, including our heart rate, our blood pressure. And the nerves that deal with our autonomic nervous system come out from the base of your spine all the way down to your tailbone. And they're feeding our organs our, um, and our balancing our, our hormones and our, and our digestive system and our gut. So they're working all the time to find that balance. Now, what's so important, like you said, is like, okay, well, how does the breathing connect with that? Well, that system has two sides to it. So it has this, think of it like an accelerator, like the on the go, busy, that's what I normally am running in yeah. the type A personality. Um, and it can also be looked at as flight, fight or freeze, as you may have heard of before, particularly flight or fight, that on the go. And we call that the sympathetic nervous system. And that's with the breath, that's usually when we're working on the inhale, expanding and moving, that gets the body to actually activate a bit more into the sympathetic nervous system and get us on the go, reactive and ready for action. You think about that too, you know, you take an, an inhale, take a breath in, then their body is already like expanded, ready for, for action. The problem is people get stuck in that inhale and that's why it's really yes. important to learn to get that rhythm and rate right. So the opposite side to that is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is still part of the autonomic nervous system. And so it's like a scale is balancing itself out. And so this is the rest, digest and recover. 
And the way that that links in with our breathing and with our heart rate is the more that we work on lengthening your exhale, that tells the body that it is getting safe and to slow the heart rate down as well. And it connects with actually one of our major well, cranial nerves called the vagal nerve. You may have heard the vagal nerve before. Yes, yes. And that's what we're training when we're looking at heart rate variability. It's the tone of the vagal nerve. We're trying to get that more smooth. And the thing with the way that autonomic nervous system works, while it's working automatically, the one thing, and this is the deal breaker that you should be going, okay, I get why breathing is important. It is the only thing on that autonomic loop that is both under conscious and unconscious control mm -hmm. is the way that you breathe. So that's how you tell your nervous system that you're safe. Right. Okay. And so lengthening the exhale is how yep. you turn the, put the brake pedal on. It tells the body, right, I'm allowed to let go. Things are safe. And I keep coming back to safety because it's a big part of trauma and the way that our body responds, both from our muscles, but also from our mind as well. And what, you know, where we see safety and how that yes. accumulates over a lifetime, yes. depending on the trauma and experiences, stresses, belief systems that have impacted the way that we see that. So we can slow the heart rate down. So how does that work then for athletes? So you have high level athletes and their heart rates are going a million miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Can they actually slow their heart rate down by doing things like this, like by doing longer exhalations? Yeah, absolutely. It's such a good question. And I work with lots of athletes around the world, but also in New Zealand. And I've had some really joyous experiences, I guess, to say working with athletes one-on-one -on -one when they're actually in the field. So I had uh, a few before COVID um, and when we could fly and travel, I traveled with a New Zealand pro golfer. So he was on the top um, golf tour in Europe and then also around China. So we went to yes. Europe with him and then China uh, for several weeks. And I got to watch and observe really and put into practice the breathing mm -hmm. tools in that moment. And the reason I was there was because of that body reaction, because it was being hijacked. And so like anybody, the more we get better at tuning into that nervous system and learning to control it, the easier it's going to be to be able to, to not be as triggered and sort of help keep you what we call that focus state. So when we're looking at performance with athletes. We've got that mm. kind of bell-shaped curve where you've got two ends of it. You've got that hyper arousal and you've got the hypo arousal. So you're being like too alert and you're being too relaxed. So really what people are going to do is train themselves to be able to work in that optimum performance stage. And yes. that's all about learning how you get the volume up of your stress system and how you turn it down. And again, it's not a one size fits all model. Um, I worked with a, an athlete just the last few weeks who's a top mountain biker in New Zealand, and they were really struggling with the, their gut gut health as well as their breathing and then how that would lead into anxiety and performance and the hormones and within a very short time frame so this is why it's all connected so these yes. top athletes it was the hormones were being influenced and that was why they couldn't perform and uh, actually compete was because the stress response has been so triggered from both the mind and then the body reaction that they weren't able to have this nice hormone regulation and that meant the body was actually breaking down muscle, wasn't able to train oh. as effectively. And with just doing two or three weeks of breathing training, first of all, the hormones began to go back to normal so they could start training again. And then they were able to eat and breathe better. So feeling better about that connection as well. And then looking at it from a, like a long-term, okay, so we've got past these dysfunctions. These are things that are making me not feel mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. those, those are like warning lights that we don't listen yes. to. It's like, mm, my gut yes. health isn't great. Mm, my fatigue is, you know, that's not normal. But we also go, but isn't it? You know, I've just always got a little bit of a headache or I've just got a little bit of this going on. So even at the athlete athletic stage, we're trying to go, but what does it look like to thrive and perform at that top level? And if you get your breathing better, so if you're performing at that top level and you're still breathing with a pattern that is um, disadvantaged, it's not just uh, giving, uh, giving you that top advantage, then that's going to impact your performance. So to go, let's thrive, then we have to work with all the things that I do with Joe Blogs, normal people, you know, that aren't working at that top level. Mm -hmm. Get your pattern right, improve your strengthening, um, and make sure you've got the different tools in this invisible toolbox that we all have that helps us to deal with stress. Because, yeah, there's so many different things. Breathing's a piece of the puzzle. 
mindset's piece of the puzzle, muscle releases, body scanning. There's so many elements. Yes. And we're not taught these though, are we? Like this is not no, a thing. We wake up no. and we go to school and it's like, here you go. Here's these things that are going to help you survive through life. I'm like, oh my goodness. I wish I'd learned this at a younger right. age. But yes, my journey absolutely. is in to share it with people at all ages and stages. Because it does, yes. it, it comes through all different levels. Only yes. a few weeks ago, I was working in primary schools in New Zealand teaching this. And the beauty of seeing these little wee kids, like little five-year-olds sitting there, eyes closed in complete stillness and just zoning out. And the minute they open their eyes, they're like, that was delicious. And I'm like, wasn't it? You know? Aww. And then I'm going to them carry that through and then these schools that are going we want to make sure we create time for these kids to learn to regulate their nervous system because they're going to learn better you know yes. if you're staying in that flight fight or freeze you can't focus you can't get that performance and it just it changes everything yes see in our singing voice community we are all aware of breathing obviously because if we don't breathe we have no sound you know we need breath to create sound and so we do a lot of work on breathing. We have different breathing techniques that we can use. But it was the work of James Nestor that really made me aware of all the other factors and the impact of breath in our day-to-day -day lives. And we don't focus on those things. And, and even things like, um, you know, is it, important how often we breathe as opposed to the quality of breath i mean are we supposed to breathe so many times per second are we all different um is is breathing deeply different to breathing slowly so what are some of those little myths that are out there around that type of thing I love that question because those misconceptions are actually what can keep people in a state of stress. You know, we used to be told, take a big breath in, you know, to actually get you to calm down. And actually when you do that, that can actually, again, activate that sympathetic nervous system and keep yes. you stuck in that freeze it's, mode. Yes. So again, that's one piece of the puzzle. My biggest one for getting people to learn to get them out of that mode is to actually work on the breath out. Like we said, the exhale is key. So without fail, exhale is the big one there so learning to breathe breathe out and again it's like well how do I breathe out how do I deflate and but letting that chest drop down because even as singers and I worked with singers a few years ago particularly this lovely group and several of them had different patterns mm -hmm. and so they could still be using the diaphragm but be hyper inflated with their rib cage so what I mean by that is they're kind of inflating the ribs and staying yes. stuck in that expanded position yes. and actually if you keep breathing in you can't breathe out. And it seems really simple, but if you don't let all the air out, you can't get the ribs to expand and the diaphragm, which is the main breathing muscle, can't do its job. So we can see singers and performers that you might be using part of the diaphragm, but they're not using all of it always. You know, it's a three, six degree mm. muscle. What I found fascinating was um, some research done this is in my mark. Oh gosh, it's going a few years ago, but my masters were looking at how breathing uh, was or breathing and back, so back pain and opera singers. So looked at different subgroups, and they found that opera singers had much less back pain than um, your normal population. Wow! Because they strengthen their diaphragm. So that's one of the other powerful things is they're using that to create our core control, and therefore they have better posture, they have um, better regulation with their nervous system. That's why singing in the first place is one of the most amazing tools to help relieve stress. Yes, definitely, and. I mean, singing and the benefits of, of even humming has, has mm. been around for such a long time. And if you look at singing and if you look at even the singing of hymns and the Buddhist monks in, in their chanting, a lot of those things, we're, um, we're exhaling for longer patterns of time to what we do inhaling. So it's, even hymns are written so that you exhale for about set six or seven seconds, you take a breath and then you're singing for that length of time again. And so this idea of breathing has been around for a long time, but why have we forgotten to breathe as a society? What is going on in our lives that well, we forget to breathe? Yeah, I think there's two things that you've made really good points with. First, the fact that our um, 
spiritual practices or whatever you're going to call them that we've been going around for so many thousands of years have both ways to practice uh, longer breaths. And then we go, I feel better after that experience. And so there's a physio- physical response and a physiological response when you're breathing in that way. Mm. So it's kind of, we don't always connect it to the fact that it's actually to do with the, the practice of breathing and the way they were lengthening our exhale. But that is one of the elements that while we feel good, it shifts our nervous system and our energy and that impacts others around us. So even practicing singing, going in communities and, and even gargling is a way that you can actually activate that body's response. Um, and that's that vagal nerve, that nerve that is connecting with that rest, digest and recovery. So there are so many things that we can do to do that. And then that second question is of like how in our modern day lives, how are we so lost in this way? Yes. And I think that comes around to actually so many factors. It's not just a one size. There is so many things in regards to our society. Um, the way that, you know, even in our culture at the moment, there is this pressure for, uh, you know, for both people and the partners and relationships to be working. There is changes in our roles and our expectations. Women, we're supposed to be, you know, stepping into so many roles that we, you know, we might be the breadwinner, we might be the parent, we might be the um, teaching or other, all these elements that we put on, these hats that we wear. But actually, we're not taking some of those things off. So there's more overwhelm. Right. There's yes. more technology that's changing it. There is... Yes. Um, diet that all changes and impacts it as well. So our food and our, uh, the way that it's been processed over so many years has impacted our gut health. And that will impact the way that we, we breathe because 80% of serotonin is actually created in our gut as a happy hormone. So if we're not, again, nurturing it from the inside, then that'll impact our nervous system, which keeps it breathing faster as well. So a lot of it can be past generations. Then we go, okay, so there's been years and years of trauma that's come through families and uh that can be from war it can be from famines and you probably don't well that seems a bit far-fetched but what we do is we mirror the patterns that have been in uh, a body language and that comes down from family to family we don't necessarily process our emotions very well still so maybe we we've still always been stressed but there yeah. we may be talking about it more and we may be seeing things a bit clearer so there's always been the element of stress but I think now we're kind of going Right. Well, we need to change things. And particularly with the mental health crisis that's happening around the world. I'm not going to say it's just New Zealand, that we have a very high really? suicide rate in our country for oh, men wow. particularly. And it comes down to my own two cents is this connection with our emotions and being able to share it. We have very much this um, concrete pill uh, culture. So, we, you know, we get on with it. We don't share. Yes. We, don't, we don't be vulnerable. And so yes. what it does to our nervous system is it doesn't get a chance to expel and, and express and our nervous system stays stressed and protective and doesn't feel safe. And that influences our hormones and our mind and our emotions. So we have so many elements that is triggering our nervous system. But the real key thing is here is we're not, we haven't been taught how to bring it back into a state of calm. And that's really what I'm all about is creating a ripple of calm around the world in whichever way we can, whether it's singing, whether it's in the sport that you play, whether it's in schools, whether it's in your work, it, it all influences your life, your relationships and how you feel at the end of the day. Absolutely. And in terms of the breathing process itself, there is the nasal breathing and then there's mouth breathing. For singing, we inhale through our mouth when it comes time to start phonating um, because that's more efficient for us and for the job that we have at hand. But in our day-to-day lives, we should be breathing in through our noses, shouldn't we? Yeah, I like that you're bringing the singing into that as well because what I can find is that people that may be singers, they still stay stuck in that pattern of either mouth breathing uh, or because when we do breathe through our mouth, the tendency is when we inhale is to start recruiting our backup breathing muscles. Obviously, if you guys are listening to the podcast, you can't see that I'm pointing towards my chest and my neck area. Right. And these muscles are used for when we need to breathe in a higher volume to mm-hmm. be able to perform and sing and, and, mm-hmm. and also to exercise if we're doing in a higher volume and when we're stressed, but they're not meant to be used all the time. So part of it is when you mouth breathe, you end up recruiting, if you do it now, even at home, take a breath in the mouth, you'll notice that you'll start to naturally breathe into your chest a little bit more. And so learning to deflate and set yourself back into a calm pattern, maybe that yes. you're going to learn to change after you've been in that mode of singing or performance. And that can be even things like, for me, I, I do a lot of public speaking. And so I'm therefore mouth, um, well, talking through my mouth, obviously, yeah. and breathing through my mouth. 
And what that does then is that can then shift my physiology because I might be breathing too much through um, or too much carbon dioxide out. And that's kind of a very geeky thing to get into. But our carbon dioxide balance is actually what's more important than our oxygen. Mm. And people think it's all about the oxygen. It's like, no, no, no. It's actually CO2 that is the trigger for our body's response to breathing. And that gets altered over time. And that is all to do with our stress response and our trauma in the past. And can be the reason why if the internal wiring in our amygdala, which is our fear center in our primitive brain, and then in our arteries and our neck, where it measures that CO2, if we over time change that threshold, then our physiology has been altered. And so then we don't know what normal is. And so it takes a bit of time to then reset that. This is why I also say it's not a one size fits all model. Yes. If somebody's been stuck in a stress state for a long period of time. And then we go, okay, let's do some like faster breaths. And then we're going to do some holds. They'll be like, oh, no, 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 no. Like their body will be like, uh, first of all, that's not how we do it. This is what my brain's going to tell you to do. And it will make you feel short of breath. It'll feel gassed. You'll feel like you've got ear hunger and it's harder to reset. So again, it's why it's figuring out where your body is in that breathing continuum. Mm. Because 20% of the world, uh, they don't have a breathing dysfunction. It's quite limited numbers, you know, two out of 10, they're breathing fine. But from the research, eight out of 10 people are not breathing in a way that is advantageous for their body. And that shows up in different things because it can be that their chemistry changes, their blood chemistry changes, can be the muscles that they're using are overworked, can be the gut health that's impacted. And so we see it play out in different ways with their body. And then that top 10% of people that have been stuck in that stress state for a, a long time. And again, you can move in that continuum. You can sometimes be doing really well and then sometimes just gets tipped over the edge. And that's when we get moved into this top 10%, which is more likely to have symptoms um, of hyperventilation syndrome. Yes. So that's not just breathing too fast, um, like having a panic attack, but actually breathing beyond the body's needs. So you asked before about, you know, should we be breathing more? Should we be breathing less? We're actually often breathing more than we need to mm. beyond yes. what we need. So we need to yes. slow down to have it's like cloud breathing. When you think about the way that you breathe, I want you to learn to actually, every time you breathe, you breathe a little bit less um, volume. And so you start to make the cloud a little bit smaller. And so it's not been over expanded instead of kind of really working on expanding and bring, taking big breaths in because that'll keep you in that hypervigilant fight, flight or freeze state. Yes. And what are some of the things that we can use to help us do that? I know that box breathing is really popular. And uh, if you want to maybe explain what that is, I know it's something that a lot of uh, psychologists are using with people who are in stress mode. Then there's things like Wim Hof and Mm -hmm. Apparently, the Wim Hof method is something that has been around for a long, long time prior yes. to Wim Hof actually coming up with it. So do you want to explain those two? Because they're the ones that are probably most, are the ones that you hear about the most. Yep. So we'll start with the box breathing. And this is something that I do teach people. But again, it depends on where you are, if we use this one or not. So box breathing is that you breathe. So they, imagine you've got a box and it's got four sides. So it keeps pretty simple. And then you're breathing in for four seconds. And then you hold for four seconds. You breathe out for four seconds. And then you hold for four seconds. So you start breathing in that pattern. Now, what's great about box breathing is when you've been in that state of anxiety and overwhelm, it focuses your brain. It gets you out of that survival mode and into more of focused breathing. It's not quite calm. It definitely isn't the calm breathing pattern that would like you to get you to. But sometimes it's the building block or the bridge to getting towards calm. Yes. And that's why we use that. And that's and, why psychologists use it a lot. Yeah. And is it too, sorry to interrupt, that in that process of doing uh, box breathing, we're only in the inhalation cycle for a quarter of the time. And that is yeah, also technically. Helpful. Yeah, but that breath hold, I mean, it's really about getting a rhythm and a rhythm right. that begins to get a bit more smooth as well. So often we find mm -hmm. people are quite erratic with their breathing. And so it gives them something to be consistent with. And then that flows into their heart rate variability, which people can see on their Fitbits and fancy, fancy watches these <laughs> days. We can start to slow that down and see that connection with it. Um, that's one way we can measure that change. So yes, it is to do with, um, you've got only a shorter inhalation. And then when you're holding that breath of four seconds, you're actually getting that diaphragm to learn to be able to stabilize for that time. But one of the key things with that is that, and this is probably what makes it 
made the big difference for me is when you understand the anatomy of it, your diaphragm breathing muscle is actually only a one-way muscle. So it's working on the inhale and yes. it should be relaxed on the way out. And that's often what we find is people just, they're either over breathing because they're using these uh, external oblique muscles to work like a pump and push the air out. And what that does to the nervous system is it keeps it in that overwhelmed state. And actually that impacts our emotions. So our emotions connect with our breathing too. Now we'll come back to that in a second, but Wim Hof style was actually, so the thing for Wim is that he's connecting um, two kind of things. He's con- oh, Well, he says three. So it's really like mindfulness, you know, being in your mind- mindfulness connection and then faster breath, which is more tomo breathing, which again has been around for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and it's bringing a faster rate, really more one-to-one ratio, kind of more of a, <sighs> that kind of speed. And for anybody that has anxiety or panic attacks, that can actually really trigger them. So it should actually really come with a bit more of a warning table with that one. Oh, um, wow. Because people try it and they feel wow. worse. And that's yes. not really as talked about. So again, I feel really careful people, people that I actually get them to turn that volume up with it. Because mm. um, you've got to know how to do it, then turn it down. So then some people have anxiety actually feel better because they've actually got themselves out of freeze mode. They're actually breathing. And so that can feel better. So it's really about, T- try it in a safe controlled way um, and then what they add in the end is the uh, ice immersion so that's really where it's kind of combining these two things and with when it comes to stress there are set, there's great research there's a lady called Dr. Rhonda Patrick or Fitzpatrick I think it's on Rhonda Patrick um, she's fabulous at looking at the benefits of uh, either cold stress or heat stress and other things that help your nervous system really d- thrive through stress in some ways and so what cold does is it actually creates the happy hormone release as well. And, and for me, I think it really depends on your body type. So yes, certainly hate, <laughs> hate, hate, hate cold stress. I um, hate I the it. cold. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, I think what I found is that a lot of people, women, we don't respond as well to that. Um, and particularly if our nervous system has already been in this flight, fight or freeze, you add that cold stress and it's a little bit, a lot harder. So for me, heat stress is much more comfortable and I think that depends on where you're at with like thyroid hormones and other hormones in the body and again that's why it's not a one-size-fits-all model men yeah. love it and I think that's a big part of it being the cold shower they can jump into legs and like wow I feel amazing like I'm manly and it's like yeah because it's triggering that response of survival in many ways but what women how women deal with stress is a little bit different you know we have this thing called tend and befriend where we need other women around us to actually make us feel safe and to bring our stress hormones down wow so going for a sauna with girlfriends is probably a much better beneficial way wow. um than doing the cold immersion for some people so there's, right. there's again there's different different strokes for different fo- folks yes do you have a favorite method that you use for yourself um, yeah, and I, it's real simple. It's actually about just learning to, uh, or I guess for me, there's a few different things I'll do. I would do a body scan. So I'd work through my body and I'd see where I'm holding tension. And it's almost like a, hello, body, what are you doing? What have you been up to? Because most of us are walking around head and body disconnected. You know, we're oblivious to what the emotions are doing. So my mother, I'm just checking in and going, okay, head, shoulders, knees and toes almost, like where is my body? And then I tune into my body and make sure that I'm breathing 360 degrees, which is what I teach when I'm doing my courses. It's quite hard to show on a podcast. Yes. So I'm making sure I'm breathing in the right area in the first place and then I'm deflating because often we can be holding tension in these muscles without even knowing it. So it's like, okay, even though I am a breathing coach and I'm a growth coach and stress coach, I'm like, you know what? I can still be hijacked just like anybody else. So mm-hmm. it's about just self-regulation. Then for me, it's always about lengthening the exhale. And there's lots of different ways of doing it, different rhythms and rates. But as long as I can kind of slow my breathing down and slow my body down and lengthen that exhale and, and take less air in, in the first place, I know my nervous system is going to feel good. But then other people, I was going to say, that's, that's what works for me. Other people actually find if they focus on breath, particularly if they've been through major trauma in their life, major stress, mm-hmm. that that's not going to feel good. That's actually going to make them feel more anxious. And so that's really, really things like body scanning. Yeah. So wow. while some people go, I feel better with that. If you've had a huge amount of trauma, or it doesn't a huge amount of trauma, it's just your nervous system regulation has been so out of whack and that your CO2 levels are set at a certain level that when you start to slow your breathing down, it goes, no, 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 no. I don't like that. And it could be because the muscles are gripping too much, like our tension that we're holding there because you're trying to get enough air in to run away from that lion or whatever that stressor is that's coming after you. Right. Yeah, it's not a one size fits all. 
Okay. So what about then exercises? We talked about building some of those breathing muscles. Are there, do you do work to help build and strengthen those breathing muscles as well? Yep. So the first step for me is to get their, someone's pattern right. And then there's lots of different ways we can do the strengthening. So then you are focusing on the inhale mostly on that because you're wanting to get the diaphragm to strengthen, uh, making sure that all that muscle's working. There's a few different devices that you can use. People that want to actually learn about the like how you can strengthen a bit further. There's a great device called the Power Breathe. Have you heard of that before? No, the Power Breathe. So what's that? Power Breathe. Yeah, so it's based, um, I actually went and visited the guys in the UK that have de- developed it. And it's um, it's like dumbbells for your diaphragm. Okay, what? so it's a br- it's dumbbells for your diaphragm. I haven't, my one's hiding around somewhere around here. I have but never heard does, of that. Yeah, so it's it's a resistance training okay. for your diaphragm. So you work on your um, but, but you can also do it badly. <laughs> That's the other advice. That's why you should have yeah. a coach to help you out. <laughs> yes. So it is about you focus on the inhale. So you put it in your mouth and then you actually focus on a hard, fast and low breath in to that belly. So you're going a mm-hmm. and you're actually using that diaphragm to get that power. And there's a lot of amazing, amazing research around the power breathe. And what I love for this is over six to eight weeks, you can actually strengthen your diaphragm, which is amazing. Um, this muscle, which is why it's so important. Yes. You can strengthen it by 13% is one of the research articles that we looked at wow. just by using the power breathe. And what we know from people that have back pain, anxiety, uh, that have migraines, headaches, um, that have uh, chronic ob- um, obstructive pulmonary disease, like COPD, lung diseases, their diaphragm is thinner than other people. We see that on ultrasounds and the research. So actually what we're doing is we're, we've got to get the pattern right first, but we've actually got to strengthen that diaphragm after that. And what that does, the other research around that, because this is the geek in me going, delving into it, is yes. that when you strengthen that diaphragm, you actually reduce the um, that reaction in the body for the, the blood can then stay in your limbs for longer when you're in times of stress. So when you're in times of stress, the body goes, right, I need to get that blood to the areas that need it the most. So organs, heart rate, uh, heart area, and um, it doesn't need to worry about things like the digestive system. That's mm-hmm. not as important. Um, but it, if you can keep the blood in the limbs for longer, that's why when you're in times of stress, people get cold fingers and cold toes. If you've oh. noticed that before, that's a real sign for me. It's like, okay, really? maybe your body doesn't know to keep the blood in your limbs for longer. Wow. Because of the way it's um, dilating through the, through the arteries. So what's really important is as you strengthen the diaphragm, you then have a bit of tolerance to stress. So your reaction to stress isn't like, <gasps> like straight away into panic and anxiety mode. You can like tolerate it longer and they found that your blood stays in your limbs for longer so great for athletes really good for athletes particularly but actually singers performers um it's just we'll training your stress it. response yeah so that's yeah. one thing that i love to use uh and then a lot of it's about patterning then we can do faster breaths similar time of breaths but there's um what's the words got in my head it'll come back to me um crier k-r-i-y-a i think is the way you say it so again faster breath pattern use more in yoga and that's a really nice way of getting the power behind it and um you get the happy hormone hit like similar to time over breathing really and it is another way of getting the diaphragm stronger and powerful but again i only use that with people that can get their breathing back to down to calm and yes because it's, it's quite an emotional release too because your diaphragm when people have been in that freeze mode for a long time, and I saw it just the other day because I do work clinically with people still, is uh, when you get into that freeze mode, a lot of it's about not wanting to feel emotions. Like, I just mm-hmm. don't want to feel it. And so we grip and brace around our external obliques, around our stomach muscles. And then when we start to soften and slow it down, and we like breathe into that belly, all those emotions, that feelings can actually come up. And then the tears come sometimes or anything can be released, the frustration, the anger. And so it's really healthy to make sure we're getting people to be able to breathe and work through the emotions at the same time. And I think that's also one of the downfalls in the way that sometimes psychology is used. It's used in a, a silo, like just dealing with the head and not the physiology of it. So bringing that people both work on heads, belief systems, psychology and trauma, but also work on the physiology and the safety in the body that's going to have a better, longer lasting result than just going, okay, let's only work on top down or bottom up. It's like, let's combine this people. Yes. And that's so important. That whole, 
holistic approach to everything because people do only focus on one area and we are a whole body like we are the the we are body mind spirit emotion we're all of those things and mm -hmm. so what are some of the amazing benefits that you know of and that you've seen for yourself that come about from great like having excellent breathing techniques or how can breathing help us in i've heard that it can help with pain management with um, migraine with asthma what what are some of the things you've seen that's such a good question and this is why when i look at who we talk about who i actually can work with like avatars the people that i impact basically i'm from five to a hundred years old because it can help anybody at any stage and that's the thing it's such a wide thing because breathing impacts yes. all of us yeah and I, I guess when we're breathing in that optimum way really what it does there's there's some key things first of all you're going to sleep better and the world has got an epidemic of um sleep mm -hmm. disorders yes and again we're not we're treating it with pills and medications yes. and not looking at the reason and why our body isn't wanting to go lie down and rest and recover doesn't feel safe again back to safety and so that's a big one anxiety and panic attacks huge one is mm -hmm. that way that you regulate your nervous system and often your body is telling you something and you're not listening and so it comes into that form of an anxiety or panic attack and if we can make it again feel safe it feels better with that neck and back pain has been a big part of my journey with people um, then learning that the way their breathing pattern their muscles that you know, cross over into different roles. So a diaphragm breathing muscle isn't just about breathing. It is about speech as well and, and performance, but it's also about stability. So the diaphragm is the roof of your core. So it comes into uh, pelvic floor dysfunction. So for women that have had babies, but men have it too, if they're not breathing in the right way, then that also impacts the whole core cylinder. And that's a really powerful one. Um, it also impacts our voice, so vocal cord dysfunction, which people, singers can have, performers can have, children can have, athletes. And it's that, again, that projection through the, uh, with our breath and how that can be impacting it from the top, which is like the, the top roof, 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 that kind of gripping mm -hmm. part with our vocal cords. Um, fatigue is a huge one. And I see that uh, every yes. day with patients I work with. And it was my part of my story. You know, I've had so many elements of the awareness of how much this impacts my body. So fatigue was definitely a big one. And it's also my way of going, okay, I can't keep pushing. I must listen in. And my body will show me in different ways now. So we all will have these little things that show up. If I'm doing too much, overloading my body, my, mine will show up on my skin um, in different ways. Um, oh, it didn't wow. used to. It's just become more of that. Like whether I get um, uh, like a, a, not a rash, it sounds like I've got contagious rash <laughs> but like something that's like irritated or I'm just not it doesn't look as fresh or um might have a, like a breakout of skin and in, in your face and stuff and it's like okay my hormones unhappy I'm not managing that very well plus if I stop and listen I go ooh, I've had the foot on the accelerator too much so that's one of my areas it may have been digestive system in the past but I've worked on that piece and so I know that when my my gut health and things I need to do to make that feel better but that's definitely a big part too. So our gut health and digestive system is going to work more optimally when we're in that rest, digest, recovery part of our nervous system. Uh, there is so many areas. One of the other things for me is our relationships. And this is the bit mm -hmm. that I don't think is kind of clarified or discussed or really opened up. But it's because it comes down to our primitive response with survival. So with stress, our body is, it needs to be supported by other people. And that'll show up in our body language. It'll show up in our facial expressions. So when we're not happy, we end up impacting the people around us, both by our heart energy, which sounds very woo-woo, but uh, we have electromagnetic field from our heart. Look up heart math if you want to understand more about that. And that will impact other people around us. But also with our body language, we, we will mirror other people's um, movements and mm. patterns. So if they're not breathing mm. in a right way, then we breathe in that right way. And then we feel stressed and anxious and that flows into our emotions that will then flow into our communication and the way that we will be able to build relationships or destroy them depending on the way that we work. Yes. And so it's really about human connection. So that's really, I'll go, okay. So yes. it's breathing for yes. uh, fatigue. Like, no, it's about human connection. Yes. That is the big piece because we won't feel safe around people if they're breathing in a stressed state and their body language is off. And so for work environments, for relationships, this has been my big one. And we haven't even talked about the comment story I went through. Really, yeah, I'd love to the, hear that. 
<laughs> we'll definitely dabble I, into that next. But that's been a big part of me understanding, mm. you know, how I have the power to manipulate my body language for good, not for evil, but to help me get through those moments of absolute chaos and drama. Yes, I did want to talk to you about that earlier on and we kind of segued into uh, other things. But do you mind sharing that story? And because that has led to you creating a whole program for women and a podcast about thriving, surviving and thriving. So do you mind sharing that with our listeners? Oh, yeah, I'm absolutely happy to do that. This has been Great. a part of my journey, knowing that, the more that we share and be vulnerable because my stuff that I've, mm -hmm. I've shared about this experience is super vulnerable, you know, crying on podcasts ain't your first sort of thing you want to do when you kind of come out from these traumas. But the more that I realize that that you, you are, that you share and be vulnerable, it creates courage in others and then connection comes. So again, that's how that humanist, the human connection comes in. I'm so the, the kind of short story you want to hear a bit more about it um the podcast that my sister and i created my sister who's based in london the other side of the world and she was like my um my private investigator sidekick <laughs> in many ways um the podcast is called conning the con it's um been number one in new zealand and, and definitely climbing the ranks in australia and around the world uh since january 2021 when we released it so it's Amazing. a story about how i uh ended up dating a con man and so post d divorce i started to go out and meet people and unfortunately i met somebody that was uh a complete lie the, the minute i met him he was lying from his name to the jobs he did and uh, you just don't expect those people to be in around but unfortunately they were so about six months, uh, I was getting to know him and it was really more of a, a friendship. And, and then there was this kind of ro rolled into more of a business uh, arrangement. And I was at that point trying to work on like how I bring my life ahead with family and kids. And um, I'd been in a really good position before divorce. And then I was like, right, this is my chance to get back into property and developing things. Uh, and unfortunately, he preyed on me, he preyed on quite a few things. And as a woman, that's a really hard place to come from. And the more that I've shared my story, I realize, gosh, I'm not the only one, but how scary it is for women out there in many ways and in all aspects of our lives. We're very vulnerable. Yes. So the crux of it was I found out five and a half months into it that he was a con man from friends that dug, dug deeper into it. I don't want to give away too much of the story, but no. actually it's actually binge worthy we and to, well worth listening yeah, to. We will definitely, everyone go listen to Conning the Con Man. Yes. Yeah. Conning the Con. It was, oh, uh, the it's. Yeah, it's been a uh, a journey to share it because the reality was, as when that day I found out who he was, I went into survival mode, and so the lessons for me were I had these tools, and I'm so lucky that I did because I I wouldn't be the woman and the person that I am today, but now able to share the story if I didn't have the tools to bring my nervous system back in and go, okay, I am literally, my life has been threatened, which is what was that feeling at that it time. It was, and, 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 and right, yeah, there was moments were where you in there danger? was. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting looking back at it there. Um, I always felt that I was going to be okay, but you never know how someone's going to react. And so mm -hmm. until he left the country, I was very fearful for my life and for my safety of my family. Um, and I was very lucky that he wasn't a violent psychopath, um, but more of a sociopath in that, in that sense of how people behave. Um, and it's more about empathy and manipulation. Uh, so there's a, there's a long layers in that. And we actually have a psychologist come onto the podcast to share those little insights, which is great. This is not a witch hunt. This is not about revenge. This is about education. So yeah. how you go from survival and I got out of that and then you got arrested and there's all these other elements along it. And then, then there's recovery and recovery is, you know, you can kind of get into that and you can be like, right, I'm just getting things back into life, back into normal. But I was like, no, there's got to be a different way of doing things. I, I understand the stress, I understand the body. There's got to be a way of getting back to that next level and beyond. And so that's where I was like, how do we thrive? And that's been my next journey in, in many ways. And it's the reason why I created my online course, Cultivating Calm. Uh, which is woman only, sorry, men. Uh, I want women to be able to have these tools to build that toolbox up to make have the tools to help get, deal with these moments of life crisis, which we're all going to go through. Like, I feel like I'm doom and gloom sometimes, but actually, this is life. We don't have a smooth yes. roller coaster, we have the highs and the lows. And actually, it's how we deal with the lows that is the most powerful piece. And so, that when I was at that low and on the bottom of the on the floor, 
I had to come back to, okay, I must notice what's happening in my body. I must express these emotions. I must not hide away from this. I must step into it. And, um, and I had to work harder at having rest and having recovery in that time because I was exhausted, like being, mm. yeah, it was an exhausting process. But I know also that it was um, a way of, yeah, from trauma, you, you actually can be grow and the wisdom that comes from it there's actually a really good movie just come out and good books by a guy called uh dr gabor mate you've heard of him no. he's um super fascinating with the he's a doctor a gp background and really worked a lot on addiction and understanding trauma so the wisdom of trauma is his book and again this is what i do i, I bring all these different tools in to help share this knowledge because again it's not just about breathing it's not just about i'm going to go meditate for 20 minutes and my mind's going to be clear it's like actually the crux of it is learning to tune in, learning to tune into our body, our emotions, our mind, and having conversations with ourselves so that we understand where we are at. And that's what I wasn't doing. That's the reason I got conned is I wasn't taking time for me to listen and tune in. And even though my, my gut was like screaming at me at certain times and I would go and research things and I thought I found the information, but because he'd changed his name legally, I couldn't find it. So then my heart would go, oh, and what my thinking brain actually would go, oh no, he's told me this. So I can't find that information out. So it must be true. You know, nobody would lie about that sort of stuff. Well, actually mm. they can. So it's kind of, yeah, wow. it's just such a crazy story with it. But what it really helped me know, and this is probably this next piece of learning for me and sharing of wisdom, is that for thought and decision-making, and particularly with leaders, what we need to be doing is coming from this embodied cognition place, which is actually where we come from our gut, understanding and listening to our gut and our body and our heart, and then our body feels safe, and then our thinking brain can actually make a choice from a place of grounded um, grounded reaction. You know, it's not from this reactivity. So that's there's so many lessons, and it's really, for me, I'm, I try and go, I'm like, am I a physio? Am I a stress coach? I'm like, I'm a growth coach. That is who I am. I help people go through moments of challenge and trauma and thrive at the end of it, whatever tool you need along the way. Yes, and it's that's a really good point you made because our intuition is way smarter than our brain and yet we're not taught to trust our intuition and yet for me, I know every time I don't trust my intuition is when I get into trouble. So yeah. I, I always listen to what my gut is telling me, how am I feeling? Or even when you get a feeling around a person as well, mm. it's not just okay, I'm feeling this in my gut, but I'm feeling this person is taking all my energy away or there's something weird about this person. And you may not even be able to identify what it is in that. Is that, is that what was happening with you? Yeah, or what ex other it was. No, both, you know, like I think, I mean, it's kind of weird. I mean, someone manipulates you at that level and they, they were working from, he, he wasn't in my community either. It was a little bit further away. So it was kind of removed and, there's all these elements of then in regards to dating people and all the the things that go along with that and how you know how that works in a modern day life and um, figuring these things out as you go through what's important and what's not mm. and so people put their best foot forward in the first place and so when I was testing things out you know you test these things it would come back and it would be like oh no that's that's uh, that doesn't make sense but okay I've checked in it and what we know is from from science and research is that our gut is actually working faster than our brain it is coming in quicker yes. so we're yes. just really good at like not listening to it and actually I think we've been programmed not to listen to it but in our mm -hmm. lives so mm -hmm. that's been a very big thing from um, our culture I think particularly as and and for women is you know it's like just you know come along in some ways like obey which sounds really derogatory to say but there are so many things about being the good girl in my life that has meant that I have not been the girl that has fought and not been able to step up and not going this is not okay um and so it's like yeah. knowing in different stages of life when you can do that yes so now that I'm really clear at listening I'm like this is the path I'm going to take mm -hmm. it's getting clearer every every day I can totally relate to that because I come from an Ital Italian culture and yeah, women are meant to be subservient and, and as a child, you're not allowed to speak up. You're not allowed to have an opinion. Children are seen and not heard. And then you marry that, you know, <laughs> so it, it is definitely. And then as you start to find your voice, the, the older you become, the more you get to a stage where you go, well, I really don't care anymore. 
Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that is such a great place. And I know we're starting to really run out of time here, but I just wanted to, uh, for you, just to share really quickly the programs that you're working on at the moment with your patients, your clients, what, because I know you have three fabulous programs especially yeah absolutely so I often um one of my favorite things is to run my thrive masterclasses so people can come on and actually you know connect with a lot of these things we shared about today so understanding how you can move from that trauma to thriving um so it's one of my favorite things if you go to the breath effect.com the breath effect then uh that's where you'll find all the information about different courses that I have but the thrive masterclass is free it's a way of connecting and starting to get that a little bit of a, a, hopefully a seed planted for you about maybe how you can do things differently. And that's really how I work. It's about taking power and ownership over what's happening in your yes. health and relationship. The second things that I have is um, in the last few years, I have been working on my um, online courses, which for me work beautifully because it has live training that I work with these people all around the world. And so each month I alternate which course I'm running. So this month it's been Breathe Right and Reduce Your Stress, which is my signature course for men and women to learn how to change their reaction to the stress. And while breathing is a, a, a key element of that, like I said, there's so many elements that come along with that. Mm. Um, and that's a 30 day course that then people can then do over 12 months so that they've got time to come back and nibble at it which way they want to and, and implement into their life. And really I'm holding up a mirror for people then about their uh, habits and what they're doing. And so it's, it's definitely something that I'm passionate about. I know it makes a huge difference in people's lives. And my final course, which really came out of the Calm Man experience was the Cultivating Calm, the Busy Woman's Guide to Cultivating Calm. And it's because we don't, again, get these taught these tools. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of it's evolved out of working with this amazing woman, Sasha Hope, who I do uh, retreats, in-person women's retreats with in New Zealand. So if you can come to New Zealand, please come and join us in uh, New Zealand near Queenstown where we run these women's retreats. And it's, it's learning to delve into this body connection. Um, but the mind as well. So it's it's building that toolbox even more for women and getting them to learn to listen into their body, into their gut and change things from a deeper level. So it's over 30 days again, so four weeks, live training with me every week. So you get that input, you get this passion that I love about it yeah. and you can start to see how maybe you need to do things differently from somebody else. And then that's done again, 12 months, you can come back and access it. So it's this intense period of going, if I'm going to make change, I've got to be supportive. And so that's where as a coach, it can't be just, okay, I'm going to see you for two hours and then uh, hopefully you've changed your life. It's like, no, 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 no. Mm. And that one really digs deeper into the emotions, our mindset and the things that we're saying to ourselves. And so for women that are feeling brave enough to join in for that, I'd love to have them on Cultivating Calm. It is probably my, my favorite one, mainly because I, I love seeing that growth in women yeah. over a very short time frame. And you don't have to be going through a major crisis to be doing that by any means. Any of the courses, it's about choosing your health and wellness. So when's the next one? the next cultivating calm when are you holding that uh so it's starting july the 12th and um so that depending on when this is going out but then the next one after that with breathe right the month so if you always check on the breath effect website since this will be evergreen podcast then you'll see which month is coming up and you can start the course straight away and the live trainings will come in later mm-hmm. on so that you don't feel like you're gonna like waiting to get going on them you can get the information the knowledge and start early and then and then join in with the lives when they're going to be coming up so it's Excellent. A, yeah, no no reason why you can't start today excellent last two questions emma what is the greatest thing you've learned about yourself over the past year through covid i am stronger than i ever knew i was beautiful love it love it <laughs> and what is the best piece of advice you want to share with our voice teaching community mm. your your voice is much more than just your lungs and your diaphragm it is your head and your heart it is everything that connects with it so to have embodied singing is um well, well i'd probably encourage oh 
Girl, you're speaking my language. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Emma, you've been amazing. We could talk for hours. Literally, there's so much more. (laughs) Yeah, there is so much more I wanted to ask you. And I think we need to have you back sometime if you would be happy to join us again. But you've been amazing. We're going to share all your information in the show notes so people will know where to find you. And we might cover off on some other topics in the future because there's just a whole canyon (laughs) of stuff there. But thank you so much. You've been really generous with your time and we appreciate you and best wishes to you for the future.